change, and everything is change, nothing can be held on to. To the degree that you go with a stream, you see, you are still. You're flowing with it. But to the degree you resist the stream, then you notice that the current is rushing past you and fighting with you. So swim with it. Go with it. And you're there. You're at rest. And this is, of course, particularly true when it comes to those moments when life really seems to be going to take us away. And the stream of change is going to swallow us completely. The moment of death. And we think, oh, oh, this is it. This is the end. And so at death we withdraw. Say, no, 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 not that. Not, not, not yet, please. But actually, the whole problem is uh, that it really is no other problem for human beings than to go over that waterfall when it comes. Just as you go over any other waterfall. Just as you go on from day to day. Just as you go to sleep at night. Be absolutely willing to die. Now, I'm not preaching. I'm not saying you ought to be willing to die and that you should um, muscle up your courage and somehow put on a good front when the, when the terrible thing comes. That's not the idea at all. The point is that you can only die well if you understand this system of waves. If you understand that your disappearance as the form in which you think you are you, your disappearance as this particular organism is simply seasonal. That uh, you are just as much the dark space beyond death as you are the light interval called life. These are just two sides of you. Because you is the total wave. See, you can't have half a wave. Nobody ever saw waves which just had crests. No troughs. So you can't have half a human being who is born but doesn't die. Half a thing. That would be only half a thing. But the propagation of vibrations, and life is vibration, it simply goes on and on, but its cycles are long cycles and short cycles. Space, you see, is not just nothing. If I could magnify my hand to an enormous degree so that you could see all the molecules in it, I don't know how far apart they would be, but it seems to me they would be something like tennis balls uh, in a very, very large space. And you'd look when I move my hand like this and say, for God's sake, look at all those tennis balls. They're all going together crazy and there are no strings tying them together isn't that queer no but there's space going with them and space is a function of or it's an inseparable aspect of whatever solids are in the space that is the clue probably to what we mean by gravity we don't know yet when you don't resist change you see that the changing world, which disappears like smoke, is no different from the nirvana world. Nirvana, as I said, means breathe out. Let go of the breath. So in the same way, don't resist change. It's all the same principle. Memento mori, be mindful of death. 
Gurdjieff says in uh, one of his books that the most important thing for anyone to realize is that you and all you, every person you see will soon be dead. See, it sounds so gloomy to us because we have devised a culture. But you see, the knowledge of death helps the ego to disappear because it tells you you can't hang on. As soon as you really discover this and you stop clinging to change, then everything is quite different. It becomes amazing. And not only do all your senses become more wide awake, not only do you feel almost that you're walking on air, but you see, finally, that there is no duality, no difference between the ordinary world and the nirvana world. They're the same world, but what makes the difference is the point of view. And, of course, if you keep identifying yourself with some sort of stable entity that sits and watches the world go by, you don't acknowledge your union, your inseparability from everything else that there is. You go by with all the rest of the things. But if you insist on trying to take a permanent stand, on trying to be a permanent witness of the flux, then it grates against you and you feel very uncomfortable. But it is a fundamental feeling in most of us that we are such witnesses. We feel that behind the stream of our thoughts, of our feelings and our experiences, there is something which is the thinker, the feeler and the experiencer. Not recognizing that that is itself a thought, feeling or experience and it belongs within and not outside the changing panorama of experience. And so it's psychologically more conducive to liberation to remember that the thinker or the feeler or the experiencer and the experiences are all together. They're all one. But if out of anxiety uh, you try to stabilize, keep permanent, the separate observer, you are in for conflict. Of course, the separate observer, the thinker of the thoughts, is an abstraction which we create out of memory. We think of the self, the ego, rather, as a repository of memories, a kind of uh, safety deposit box or record or filing cabinet place where all our experiences are stored. Now, that's not a very good idea. It's more that memory is a dynamic system, not a storage system. It's a repetition of rhythms, and uh, these rhythms are all part and parcel of the ongoing flow of present experience. First of all, everything you know is remembered, but there is a way in which we distinguish between seeing somebody here now and the memory of having seen somebody else who is not here now, but whom you did see in the past, and you know perfectly well when you remember that other person's face, it's not an experience of the person being here. How is this? Because memory signals have a different cue attached to them than present time signals. They come on a different kind of vibration. Sometimes, however, the wiring gets mixed up and present experiences come to us with a memory cue attached to them. And then we have what is called a déjà vu experience. We are quite sure we've experienced this thing before. But the problem is that we don't see, and don't ordinarily recognize, is that although memory is a series of signals with a special kind of cue attached to them so that we don't confuse them with present experience. They are actually all part of the same thing as present experience. They are all part of this constantly flowing life process 
and there is no separate witness standing aside from the process, watching it go by. You're all involved in it. Now, accepting that, you see, going with that, although at first it sounds like the knell of doom, is if you don't clutch it anymore. Splendid. That's why I said the death should be an occasion for a great celebration. That people should say, happy death to you. Uh, and always uh, surround death with joyous rites, because this is the opportunity for the greatest of all experiences when you can finally let go because you know there's nothing else to do. So we get finally, not quite finally, to the void, the shunya. And what then? When you get to the void, there is an enormous and unbelievable sense of relief. That's nirvana. Phew, as I gave a proper English translation of nirvana. Ah, great. <laughs> so they are liberated, and yet they can't quite say why or what it is that they found out. So they call it the void. But Nagarjuna went on to say, you mustn't cling to the void. You have to void the void. And so the void of non-void is the great state, as it were, of Nagarjuna's Buddhism. But you must remember that all that has been voided, all that has been denied, are those concepts in which one has hitherto attempted to pin down what is real. The void, shunyata, is like space. Now space contains everything. The mountains, the oceans, the stars, the good people and the bad people, the plants, the animals, everything. Now the, the mind in us, the true mind, is like that. You will find that when Buddhists use the word mind, they have several words for mind, but I'm not going into the technicality at the moment. They mean space. See, space is your mind. It's very difficult for us to see that because we think we're in space and look out at it. There are various kinds of space. There's visual space, distance. There is audible space, silence. There is temporal space, as we say, between times. There is musical space, so-called distance between intervals or the intervals between tones rather it's quite a different kind of space than temporal or visual space there's tangible space but all these spaces you see are the mind they are the dimensions of consciousness and so this great space which every one of us apprehends from a slightly different point of view, in which the universe moves. This is the mind. So it's represented by a mirror. Because although the mirror has no color, it is for that reason able to receive all the different colors. Meister Eckhart said, in order to see color, my eye has to be free from color. So in the same way, in order not only to see, but also to hear, to think, to feel, you have to have an empty head. And the reason why you are not aware of your brain cells, unless you're only aware of your brain cells if you get a tumor or something in the brain, when it gets sick. But in the ordinary way, you're totally unconscious of your brain cells. They're void. And for that reason, 
you see everything else. So that's the central principle of the Mahayana. <clears throat>